Welcome to Strength in the Numbers. My name is Andrew Codd, accountant, author, and commercial finance entrepreneur. And it's my job each week to bring you leaders in finance and business and deconstruct with them their real stories, insights, and hard-won lessons into practical advice on the key strengths and qualities you need to remain relevant in accounting and finance today, as well as the steps you can begin to take to elevate the impact you make to have a fun, successful, and rewarding career in accounting and finance. Now let's go over to the show. Storytelling engages our brain in very specific ways. It engages people's emotions. I think it's part of the reason that accounting and finance people resist it because I have been told many times in my career, leave your emotions at the door, right? This is business. There's no place for emotions here. But the reality is human beings make decisions based on emotions and then they rationalize them with facts and with data. And just because we're accounting and finance professionals doesn't mean that that changes. Our brains still work the same. So if we choose to ignore that, again, we do it to our detriment. So why not understand it and use it to our advantage rather than ignoring it, pretending like it's just not the case? This is just one of the many fantastic pieces of advice shared by today's guest mentor, John Sanchez, who, although started out life in finance and accounting as part of a CPA firm, has actually gone on to specialize in communication training and skills development. And talking together with John, it just felt like we could just keep talking and talking and talking because he had so many great bits of advice to share. So some of them we've managed to trap in a podcast. So you'll hear how to better develop and learn the skill of communication, uh, being an adaptable, authentic speaker, and also the value of storytelling in business, the hero's journey and emotions for us finance professionals also in telling the story. So hope you enjoy this episode. If you did, please remember to let your friends and colleagues know about us. Comment, subscribe, we're on all the major platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, YouTube, and Spotify. And John mentions loads of great resources at the end of the show, as well as ways to connect with him. So please check out our show notes at SICNshow.com. So now without further ado, over to John and the show. So, John, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Been looking forward to it. And likewise, John, and and so as as we regularly do here, we just ask our guest mentors to give a brief introduction to their journey in accounting finance. Would you mind sharing a bit of that with our audience, please? Sure. I guess I'll start at the beginning. So I, I started out in accounting. I got my degree in accounting and I started out working for a large CPA firm, which eventually was merged into E&Y. And then I transitioned out of that after a couple of years and moved into an M&A role at a company that went the way of the dinosaur. Um, I worked at Blockbuster for a couple of years in their heyday. And then when they were acquired by Viacom, I took a role at Royal Caribbean and in the corporate planning department. So that was my first role where I, I would say that that's a a real sort of FP&A planning role. And then I had similar roles at Royal Caribbean, Arby's, the fast food chain here. I don't know. Do, do they have those in in uh, Ireland, Arby's? No, but I'm aware of them for for my travels, yes. It's a a roast beef sandwich fast food chain. So I did corporate planning for them. And then what I would call my last sort of big corporate role was working at AutoNation. I think they still are the largest retailer of automobiles or used automobiles anyway in in the US. And I worked in corporate planning there where I managed the five-year strategic plan for an $11 billion business unit of theirs. And so that business unit was a used car division, which after about a year, they shut down and they, they let go about 450 people, just closed the entire business unit. And so I was literally sitting at home trying, figuring out what in the world I was going to do next. And long story short, they hired me back as a consultant. And I sort of have been on my own as a consultant ever since doing a variety of different FP&A consulting roles. And so that brought me up to about 2011. And in 2011, I was contacted by someone that worked at an organization called the American Strategic Management Institute. They're a, they were kind of a think tank and training organization out of Washington, D.C., and they asked me to do some training for them. And I kind of got bit by the training bug. So over the years since 2011 till now, we've sort of shifted gears from being strictly an FP&A consultancy 
to adding on a little bit of training that we would do for finance and accounting professionals. And now we're more focused on the training piece and we do a lot less of the actual consulting. Okay. So that's, that's the short version. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, look, I know it's a, for you, it's a short version, but for our audience, I think there's a lot of learnings in there that you developed along the way. And uh, I guess when we started talking, I sort of reached out because I was very, very intrigued as to how you managed to distill a key area for us nowadays around communication, John, uh, and some of your thoughts on that space. I mean, how did how did that come about in terms of as a, as a focus for you, like tailoring communications for our audience and things like that? Well, there was a part of my career where I was doing FP&A consulting, and I won't digress on this on all of the details of how I got into it, but I got recruited into being a financial advisor. And I thought, you know, I've got all this finance background and financial advisors kind of help educate people and, and basically do sort of what corporate FP&A people do, but for individuals, right? They help them plan out their future. And so I got into that role naively thinking that that was just sort of a, a more personalized way to do planning without realizing that I was actually becoming a salesperson. That's absolutely a sales role, although it's very much kind of a finance type focus. And so I started to realize that coming from an accounting and finance background, I was very detail oriented, very analytical. And so I would present things to people in a way that I was used to presenting them to people in finance and accounting. And I started to realize that non-finance people don't generally like things presented to them like finance people do. It's too much information. It's too detailed. It's too analytical. And so I started to realize I need to work on how I present things to people. And so I started plugging into all sorts of self-development, everything from reading books to, you know, back in the day, listening to cassette tapes and CDs and going to seminars and just working on myself to become a better communicator myself. And then as I started speaking at these different industry events, I started to look at the curriculum. And so if you've been to any of these events, let's say there may be a three-day event, and I started to notice there was very little in the curriculum providing any kind of training around communication. So I thought, well, I've gotten better at this by applying myself and, and just doing the work. And there seemed to be this perception by a lot of people that I think is still a common misperception that I'm either a good communicator or I'm not, as though we're born that way and we can't change it. And so I started to focus more on that for myself and then offering it up as courses for other finance and accounting professionals. And it just it's kind of grown from there. I know you said you sort of noticed that trend, John, right? Mm -hmm. but I suppose, has that changed anyway? Has it got more intense? I mean, what's the trigger for a lot of people when it comes to recognizing the, the need for this communication? Because you, you're right in what you say, right? It's uh, I don't feel it's something that we're probably shown enough. I don't know if it's one of those things that it's more like you learn on the job. Can you be, be taught it? I mean, what's the best way for people who want to, 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 to enhance their communication skills. I mean, what, what's the best way for those listening to go about getting it? Well, I think there's, there's a lot of options out there and no one, there's no one correct answer for everyone. I think the best option for most people is to just get out there and try something. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't feel like it suits you, let's say, for example, you say, okay, well, I'm going to try this webinar that so-and-so is, is offering. If it doesn't resonate with you, maybe pick up a book on the topic. If that doesn't suit you, I, I'm very kind of ADD, so books are challenging for me. I, I kind of have to force myself to read books, which I think is partly why I, I lean more towards video because it forces me to engage my whole brain as, I, as I'm watching as well as listening. For some people... And I, I'm one of those people that's more kinesthetic. I much prefer face-to-face -face training where I can see people's body language. And I can, when I'm delivering training, I can walk up to someone and, and engage them with eye contact and things like that. So I think research will tell you face-to-face -face technically is the best way to teach. But if you can't get somebody there, it doesn't matter what's the most effective if they're not there. I think there's still a lot of pushback. Uh, so there's a lot to be done in terms of education of the people that are in a position to make decisions. So just as one example, I've done work for the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. And I was in a conversation with the director of learning and development for one of the state CPA societies. 
And I was talking to him about this exact thing. These are some courses that I offer centered around communication skills. And they literally said to me, I agree with you that they're important. The challenge that we have is our state board of accountancy will not grant continuing education credits for that topic. So we can't, we can't offer them. So there are still some systemic things out there that are impediments to people. Because I think a lot of people will are much more likely to take a course if they're getting continuing education credits for some certification, especially if their employer's paying for it, right? Well, yeah, but but to some of our audience, that's gonna it's gonna sound really strange because I think the fact that they're listening to a podcast and us communicating with each other is probably gonna to tend to suggest you'd wonder why communication skills or let's turn it around listening or, or active or effective listening skills aren't part of like core curricula or at least get some some recognition uh from from a training and development or learning and development perspective i mean that's uh that's i'm, I'm sort of shocked that uh, that we're still in that type of state of play well i think it's a big perception challenge I'll, I'll just give you one example when i when i spoke at my first conference when i never got up and, and spoke in front of a big group before i thought you know i've spent you know it was a two or three day event and so in between each each training session i i would uh, network and meet with people and we'd exchange business cards and i thought well when i go home i'm going to hop on linkedin and i'm going to connect with all these people to as a, a way to stay in touch and what i quickly realized is i would say probably half of the people that i had met didn't even have a linkedin profile and the ones that did it wasn't very complete and I started to realize that there is a very big perception in a lot of accounting and finance circles that certain things are for other people or other professions. We, we touched uh, before we, yeah. we, we started mm -hmm. this conversation um, talking about storytelling. Yes. And I have found that I literally have to sell people on why storytelling is valuable in business because I think they associate the word storytelling with entertainment, right? Yes. And so yes, I have to connect the dots for them that the reason, and I use this example when I, when I do my storytelling courses, I could be in a room of 300 people and I'll ask them all to play along with me to fill in the blank. If I were to say, may the force, how many people could fill in the blank? Almost, so here's what I find fascinating. In, in almost every case, the vast majority of the room will say, I'll say, may the force. And before I even ask them to fill it in, people will say, be with you. <laughs> They're already there. <laughs> and then I look around the room and I realize there's millennials in here that weren't born for 20 years after that movie came out. That movie came out 40 years ago. So why and how and why can we remember a line from a movie that came out before we were born in some cases for some people? Because they use storytelling. Right. And then I can transition and we can talk about the, the various aspects of, you know, what makes a story and so on and so forth. But the follow up question I then ask is, how many of you think 40 years from today, I could ask you about a meeting that you sat in 40 years ago and you could tell me anything at all that you remember about that meeting? <laughs> and yet, if I ask you, is your job important to you? Most people would say, of course, it's important. That's about how I make my living. It's my career. So why do you remember less about a business meeting than you remember about a movie you saw? Because it's based on how our minds work, how our brains work. And if we ignore that, we do so to our own detriment. You know what? I'd even probably add on to that, John, now that you mentioned, I thought I have fascinated, but the, the, you know, like in meetings on a lot of instances, particularly in finance, we're there to support decisions being made right and mm -hmm. so meetings are actually quite important places for us uh, sometimes to be so you know from a mem from a memorable perspective or from a how do you say a very important part of our roles so so having effective stories would that in any way help get messages across better in any way or, or more effective decision making is that is that is that uh, the use of stories or, or where could accountants and finance professionals benefit from being better storytellers yeah, I absolutely think that they could. I mean, I, I have uh, several courses that I've taught on the topic, and the whole focus is using the core concepts of storytelling, the same concepts that entertain entertainers use, people that write books 
or make movies using those same concepts, breaking something down like Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. So if yes. other than people that I've met who are English lit majors in college, most people in accounting and finance have never heard of the hero's journey. And it's way too complicated and laborious for most people to use in a business setting. But by breaking down a few simple aspects of that, like having a hero in your story, and that hero, typically most people are inclined to make the hero themselves. They see themselves as, I'm going to be the hero and the champion of, let's say it's a project that they want to get approved, right? And what I share with people is instead of making yourself the hero, make yourself the mentor in the story that you're telling, make your audience the hero, because that engages the person and makes them want to buy into the story and follow the story, right? And then instead of you being the Luke Skywalker that's the hero, you can be the Yoda who's the mentor. And so you're sort of leading them through the story, but they're the hero, they're the champion of the project that maybe you want to get approved. Maybe it's some new software package that you want to implement in FP&A because it's going to make planning a lot easier, right? Storytelling engages our brain in very specific ways. It engages people's emotions. I think it's part of the reason that accounting and finance people resist it because I have been told many times in my career, leave your emotions at the door, right? Yes. This is business. Yeah. There's no place yes. for emotions here. But the reality is human beings make decisions based on emotions and then they rationalize them with facts and with data. And yes. just because we're accounting and finance professionals doesn't mean that that changes. Our brains still work the same. So if we choose to ignore that, again, we do it to our detriment. So why not understand it and use it to our advantage rather than ignoring it, pretending like it's just not the case? Yeah, actually, you, you remind me of a very funny story, John. When uh, so I'm not going to tell it properly here, but um, I know when I started out, it was just when you sort of said that people make their decisions emotionally, you know, and then tend to rationalize them afterwards and whatever. It's it's um, you know, when I started my counter, obviously doing a lot of training. It's very rational. You don't really focus too much on the emotions. So when I'm I'm coming up against stakeholders or business partners, I'm um, saying, well, this makes complete sense. You know, why, why don't you get it? You know, I, I, I get this. So what do I have to do for you to get it? Mm -hmm. I was completely forgetting the emotional side of it. It was only a few years into my career that someone sort of reminded me of the emotional side. And then I started embracing more, having a bit more success. And then just to say, embracing my ability to go tell stories. And, and that's how I was used to get my points across was anecdotes, stories, um, key sayings. And, and But I, I love how you, you brought in the hero's journey. I never thought about setting that up as being the Yoda in the story. Uh, I think everyone wants to be the Luke Skywalker. Let the audience or the people receiving um, the communication be the Luke Skywalker. Let them be the hero. I think that's mm -hmm. that's a really cool way of looking at it. Who doesn't um, want to be a hero? <laughs> oh, well, it, it, there you go. I, exactly, exactly. I, I, another thing that um, I was obviously reading one of your articles, I loved your platinum rule as well, because I think a lot of people go in thinking, you know, do unto others as, you know, you'd like to have undone to your, uh, done unto yourself. Mm -hmm. But when I sort of said I rediscovered the emotional side and what people want, I really loved your platinum. Would you mind maybe going through that for our audience? Sure. So most people have probably heard the golden rule, like you just articulated, do unto others as you would like done unto yourself. And the platinum rule simply says, everyone doesn't want to be done unto the same way. And so I'll use a simple example of like going to a restaurant and ordering a steak. My girlfriend and I, we go out to a restaurant, we order the same steak, but she likes hers well done. And I like mine medium. If we get each other's steak, we're not happy. Right? There's nothing wrong with that steak. If we just exchange steaks and she and now she gets the one that she ordered, that's the one that she wanted and she's happy. Right, That steak is not right or wrong or good or bad or better or worse. It just suits what I want better. And oftentimes what we do in communication is we give what we want to receive. And when I was a financial advisor, I gave lots of information. I gave lots of details. I spoke from my left brain, I, I spoke logically and rationally and linearly, but everyone's different. And so the platinum rule says, find out how people want you to communicate with them and then give them communication the way they prefer it, not the way you prefer it. 
I think uh, for a lot of us, maybe if we're coming up against obstacles like uh, like in tennis, like with the net ball, trying to get the ball over the net, and mm-hmm. it feels like we're not getting that ball back from when you communicate. I mean, that could be the reason for those net balls where it's just not getting over or coming back. Mm-hmm. Is we're just not communicating in the right way, yep. and, uh, and and like um, John, is there sort of any things that we can? I mean, I know I know this might sound, sound like a simple question, but how how can we make sure we're doing that? I mean, and, and learning the discipline to do that because that, that for us and as accountants and finance professionals is not the easiest thing to do given how logical some, a lot of us think. Yeah, it's kind of counterintuitive and it doesn't come naturally for a lot of people. So the, the two biggest things that I think people can do is number one, ask questions. And then number two, use your awareness, both self-awareness and awareness of other people. So that takes for a lot of people that takes time and effort to develop their awareness to be able to walk into a room and be observant enough to realize that hey i see that that person over there is talking to the person next to them and they reached over and they put their arm on their shoulder they touch them that they're they're naturally a more kinesthetic person they're kind of touchy feely right people who are more kinesthetic if you listen to the way they talk they use terms that are more kinesthetic. They might say something like, you know, that that really feels right to me, right? The word feel is kinesthetic. So if you're aware of that, you pick up on that, and then you respond in kind using terms that resonate with them, how does this solution feel to you? Do you feel like you could move forward with that, that strategy that we mapped out for you? So that awareness of listening to other people and then also being self-aware how am I coming across to other people? Are they picking up the message that I'm intending for them to pick up? Am I being clear with them? Um, Is my voice volume and my rate of speech, is it comfortable for them, right? So being able to kind of understand where you are in the, the whole exchange of communication, how you're giving that communication. And then the question piece, as you're observing and being aware, you may have questions that come up because you haven't been able to figure it out simply by observation alone. So then maybe you just ask some simple questions. So you could ask people simple questions about their preferences. Like, you know, if we were working on a project together, what's your preferred medium of communication? Would you rather I I send you a text message through WhatsApp? Do you prefer email? Would you rather I pick up the phone and give you a call? What works better for you? And I think a lot of people would appreciate just even being asked that. I mean, it's not about trying to figure it out for ourselves sometimes. I mean, you know, it might be the case. You just ask ask the question, what's your preferred mode of um, you know, medium and, and giving them the options to pick mm-hmm. from. And uh, that I actually, I actually, actually really like that. One thing I would say, though, in terms of when you're sort of saying adapting ourselves, I can hear probably some people thinking, well, you know, Andrew, sometimes you've got people on the show and they're saying you should be yourself and be more authentic. I've got, I've got a fee, I've got a view on this, but but John, like, what do you think? If we're adapting ourselves all the time, are we really being authentic that way? Well, so this this question comes up all the time, especially in some of the training that I do, where we'll talk about a lot of different aspects of how we can adapt our communication to be more effective. And so, you know, it's inevitable. Someone will ask what you just asked. So the the simple answer is there's there's no one correct way of doing it, but you have to find a balance between give and take so that you're flexing without breaking. So you want to be adaptable to give someone that communication the way they want to receive it without you giving up who you are. So I'll I'll give a simple example that I think is is easy for people to relate to. Are you familiar with Tony Robbins, this personal development guru? Yeah, I've I've seen him around, yeah, on on the TVs and the web, yeah. So... Years ago, I went to one of his events. It's his, back then, it was his Keystone event, uh, Unleash the Power Within. It's the one where he famously has people walk across hot oh, coals. The hot coals, yes. Yeah. yes. And so in that event, the second you walk in, it's in this giant arena with thousands and thousands of people. And you walk in, and it, it feels like you're in a techno dance club. There's <laughs> electronic music blasting at, at God knows what decibel level. And there's people jumping up and down and it's, they're cheering like they're at some kind of sporting event, right? And the, there are, are points in the event 
where he's speaking and everything's quiet. And then you'll go to a break and that break is back like being in a, a nightclub. That's Tony Robbins version of enthusiasm. But when I'm enthusiastic, I might not be jumping up and down at all, but my voice gets a little more intense. My voice might actually go a little softer, but you can hear the intensity in my voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my version of enthusiasm. So if you're speaking with someone and you feel like this person needs someone to really communicate enthusiastically for them to feel bought in, be enthusiastic, but be your version. Don't be, if you're more like I am and you're more reserved, don't be artificial and try to jump up and down and pump your fists in the air if that's not comfortable for you because people have a BS meter, right? Everybody has a BS meter. So your intensity will come across and it's the same for whatever the emotion is that you're trying to communicate. Use that emotion if that's what that person needs to feel in that conversation, but do your version of it. Really, really like how you sort of played that back there, John. And uh, I think that's the word. Some, you know, some fellow professionals out there thinking that you're, uh, if you keep adjusting, you sort of lose yourself. But I think that's a very fair trade off. It is a bit of give and take, but don't lose yourself in the communication as well. Got to be true to yourself also. But appreciate it. We're all different and everyone's got an effective way that works for them. And practice, practice with feedback, practice, I yeah. think, is yeah. a great way to get better at that. And you can do it with other people giving you feedback. You can do it by yourself. You could film, you could record yourself. Just, you know, like we're recording this, this podcast, you could record yourself giving a presentation or maybe practicing a conversation. Maybe you have to have a excuse me, a difficult conversation with someone at work. And so maybe you practice that and you record it. When you listen it, listen back, you might realize, ooh, I sound a little harsher than I intended there. Or maybe I need to be more direct and not beat around the bush. I, I beat around the bush because I it's something I didn't want to have to address, but doggone it, I have to address it. I need to just <laughs> go head on instead of beating around the bush for five minutes. Yeah, but John, I think that's fantastic advice. And look, you know, you've been offering us great advice uh, I'd love to ask you, though, like what's been the best bit of advice you've ever received? Well, I would have to say this was some advice I got from my brother, which was kind of totally unexpected. So just for some perspective, my brother is a very successful CPA and attorney. He, he practices mergers and acquisition law. So he, he uses his CPA every day in, in his, his practice. And he's about five years older than I am. So I've always looked up to him. So I've always kind of gone to him for advice. And years ago, I was kind of in, in a spot in my career where I wasn't sure what I wanted to do as kind of the next step in my career. I thought I might want to change careers. And I had all these different ideas. And so I was bouncing them off my brother. And he was kind of patiently listening. And then he kind of interrupted me and he said, look, you got a lot of ideas going on but you need to pick something and you need to run with it. And whatever that thing is, you need to be the best at what you do, regardless of what it is. Pick something, get good at it. And at that time I was doing consulting. So even though he works for a large firm, he said, you need to have a very personal relationship with every single client. He said, that's what that has set him apart as an attorney is a lot of attorneys out there, kind of like we were talking about with the storytelling, they feel like, well, this is a very technical job and I'm going to negotiate this deal for you and make sure that all the points are in your favor, but they're not personal in their relationships with their clients. My brother takes his clients out on his boat with him and has goes out to dinner with them and involves them in charity events and things. He, he has a personal relationship with them. The other thing he said was 100% concierge service. I said, well, what in the world does that mean? He said, you make everything easy for them. I don't, when I send them, if, if we've got paperwork to do, I make sure that all they have to do is sign. I explain everything to them so they don't have to read through it and try to figure out what in the heck all these legal terms mean. I'm available 24-7, 365. Doesn't matter if it's a holiday, dinner time, doesn't matter. 100% availability. And then the last thing that he told me, which I see far too many people not doing, is be willing to give people advice, not just offer options. 
I see a lot of professionals that will tell you, here are your three options and here are the pros and cons. Which one do you want to do? And what the really successful people do that sets them apart is they say, this is what I think you should do and here's why. Because people are paying big bucks if you're a high level consultant. If you're, if you're a high level anything, you're not cheap. And people want your advice. That's what they're going to you for in the first place. You're the expert. Give them advice. Yeah, it's just an interesting one because there's, there's that uh, evolution where you do generate options, but then it sort of seems to stop. And I do think that, now that you mention it, John, those those of us that tend to, to hit the higher levels or go a bit further tend to be the ones that follow it through a bit. So they evolve a solution and then go help deploy it or go deploy it. You know, they just don't leave it. Oh, here you go, um, decision maker. Or here you go, uh, manager or client or whatever. They just leave it. Um, there at the option stage no they, they take it further yep and i think um, and i think that that will separate um i suppose the the, the more valued uh, finance professionals from the ones that aren't so valued so look great great advice really appreciate you sharing john and I, I suppose then you know in terms of yourself would you have any resources that you might recommend our audience go check out you know if it's not a book so i remember you saying earlier uh, about books might not be a thing but if it's a book or a documentary or or, or a web link or anything you could recommend well, of course, selfishly, I could recommend resources that, that my company puts out. We do a lot of training in some of the areas that we talked about, but I am an equal opportunity improver, for lack of a better term. So there are a lot of free resources out there. Some of the podcasts and the, the people that I follow that I think people could really take a lot from, one of them is uh, Tim Ferriss. It's F-E-R-R-I-S-S, two R's and two S's. He's got one of the most popular podcast in the world that's been out there for a handful of years. And he bills himself as a human guinea pig. And so he's always experimenting with different technologies and different strategies, everything from the foods that he eats to workouts that he does to different techniques for being more efficient. Um, there's another so his podcast, I think, is just called the Tim Ferriss Podcast. You can just Google it. Um, there's another guy who I've started following recently who is very much into, I guess you could call it meta learning. So learning how to learn more effectively. It's a guy named Jim Quick. It's, uh, his last name's K-W-I-K. I'm actually going through his speed reading course right now. I just thought with with what I do in learning and development, I'm always... I'm just always having to consume new information to be to be on sort of that leading edge. I, I heard a phrase many years ago from a guy that I really admired that said, you always have to have a value gap if you want to be a leader. People always have to feel like there's some gap between you and them where they need to come to you for that value that you have that's kind of helping them close that gap. And so for me, that's always been reading and, and self-improvement, whether it's seminars or webinars or conferences or uh, mentors or all these different things. And so I just thought, gosh, speed reading is almost like cheating, right? It almost gives you like an unfair advantage. It's like taking steroids for your brain, sort of. Great analogy. <laughs> but but yeah, but, but it is, I suppose, right? I mean, if you think about it, we um, I, we had a guest on recently and he was saying that uh, way he separated himself, 5 x himself, I think he said it was, was um, he looked at um, every single annual report in his industry, not within his country, but within, within the world he could get his hands on and he studied them. Hmm. And then he was like a master of that area. He could he could advise boards or managers on things that he'd seen in other annual reports as to what his competitors were doing. Mm -hmm. And he could go and visit a client and say that to them. It's like, where you were X, Y, and Z were doing this. Yep. And uh, I think it was in retail. So he had an awful lot to go through. There's a lot of retailers out there. Oh, uh, there's um, a ton. Uh, small amount. So, you know, like, I think that's really great advice, actually. <laughs> you know? So, uh, so, 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 John, I really do hope you update us on how that goes for you. Um, I love the analogy. You know, the brain on steroids. <laughs> yeah. Well, there, there's two specific resources, too, that I, I'll mention. That One is a book by Tim Ferriss called Tools of Titans. It's relatively recent. It came out in the last year or so. And it's kind of like, I look at it like a modern day version of Think and Grow Rich. And so the whole book is interviews with people who are like the apex predators in their industry and just asking them about some of the key things that they thought were most important to their success, um, which is, I don't know if you've read Think and Grow Rich or if your listeners have, but that's kind of a, it's a very old book that came out, I think in the twenties or thirties, but I think it's a keystone 
for anyone who's into self-improvement. It was just interviews and a distillation of the best practice, the sort of robber barons or the industrialists from back in that time. And this is a modern day version of that, that Tools of Titans by Tim Ferriss. And then the other book that I think is very important is one called What Matters Most. And that's a book by a guy named Hiram Smith. He is the guy who pretty much created the Franklin Planner uh, planning system, the paper day planners that people used to use before you know, we had everything in our phones. And the biggest takeaway I got from that book is the title itself says it all. What matters most is focusing first on those things that are most important. And there's a book that I'm going back through for a second time called the 80-20 rule, which is just all about that. And I think it's something that most accounting and finance professionals has pro have probably heard of the 80-20 rule or the Pareto principle, but I would be willing to bet money that most of them ignore it on a daily basis. They, they don't sit down and before they attack their to-do list, sit, sit down and give some thought to what is going to give me the biggest bang for my buck in terms of, of the tasks that I devote my time to. And then create my task list based on that rather than what people are asking me to do. I, I will hold my hand up and say I'm guilty of doing that too sometimes, even though I recognize the power of the 80-20 rule. I do it all the time and I preach this stuff. It's, <laughs> so it's, it's why we have to always be plugged in. Yeah, but, but, but also it's also why we have to have these conversations, right? So we could sort of, ah, yeah, trigger it again. Yes, I remember. I've got to start doing it again and commit to doing it. Yes. You know? So, uh, so John, thank you for, for mentioning. Uh, I, I think they're great resources. Some of them I'm familiar with, some I need to check out some more. Uh, but, but if some of our audience wish to continue the conversation with you, you know, where's the best place to connect with you at? You can always connect with me on LinkedIn. My business website, thefpagroup.com. It's T-H-E-F-P-A group, G-R-O-U-P.com. We have a YouTube channel called Inside FP&A. We, we don't have a lot of videos up there yet, but we will be populating that with more as we go. There is a blog on my website, but for business purposes, I have found LinkedIn to be one of the best uh, go-tos there. Yeah, I completely, completely agree. John, and, and I'll put those notes, uh, sorry, uh, links in the show notes. And I suppose then if, you know, we're wrapping this up, I, John, I, I really thought that the uh, way you went through how we could potentially adapt without losing ourselves, the platinum rule, the importance of storytelling and uh, and the hero, the hero um, is journey. And thinking about uh, the, the audience as Luke Skywalker and ourselves as you I thought was fantastic. But I suppose, would you have any other parting thoughts for our audience? Well, I think, you know, we've talked a lot about some very non-technical aspects of finance and accounting. And one of the areas that I've started focusing a little bit more of my time on is in paying more attention to where our profession is going and how that's changing the skills that are important. And as AI and RPA, you know, artificial intelligence and robotic process automation, as they start taking a foothold in, now it's mostly larger organizations, but I think that will start to expand into even smaller organizations the nature of what is valued as finance and accounting professionals is already changing. And so I would encourage people to think more about developing their ability to draw insights from whatever analysis that they're doing. I think there's been a lot of focus on getting better at performing analysis and technology is starting to get to the point where it's doing more of that for us. And so the, the actual physical act of analyzing data is getting less and less relevant. And being able to draw insight from that data that automation and artificial intelligence is not capable of. And what will help us get better at that is getting more experience outside of just the analysis. So operational experience, for example, to understand what makes our business tick so that we have that as context. So when we look at the analysis, it makes more sense and we can draw conclusions from that. That's where I would encourage people to focus. I think that was a nice way of rounding it off, John, because you know, pre in our previous conversation, 
we were discussing areas about how to get our messages across more effectively and, and how to adapt those. This is actually, I think, a very useful area for us to, uh, to, to draw the insights out in the first place and then use what we, we, we learned earlier to try and get the messages across and the insights across. So, so John, look, really appreciate you investing your time with us today and coming on the show. Well, thanks for having me. I enjoyed being here. So there you have it. Hope you enjoyed today's show. If you'd like to know more about our guests today, their bio, and follow up on the resources mentioned during the show, you can find all the relevant links and more at sitnshow.com. There you'll also be able to get access to earlier shows, read the latest blogs. There's also an opportunity to subscribe to our newsletter, which will give you heads up as to when the next show is coming out, latest events, news, and anything that's going to be relevant to help you have a fun, rewarding, and successful career in finance and accounting. And just before you go, we really appreciate your feedback. If there's something we can do better on the show, something that's not working, or something you'd like to see, even a guest you'd like for us to invite onto the show, someone who you think might be able to benefit you more and also the rest of our community, please let me know. You can email me. I'm at andrew at sitnshow.com or feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Just drop me a message so I know how you found me and we can connect. And really, it's our community that will make the show. If we keep engaging and driving each other on, we'll keep on building our strength in the numbers. And when all is said and done, if we can do the numbers better and finance better, we'll create more opportunities for ourselves, our friends, our families, our communities and our businesses. So until next time, have a good rest of the week. Take care and let's keep building our strength in the numbers. 